Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Elmhurst Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, we are here today for a mental health lecture, which we are very excited about. But first, some very brief housekeeping. Um, if this is your first time here, we're so happy to have you. Um, if you need to use the restroom at any point, they are out this door and to my right or to your left. And uh, there's also a water fountain um, in between the restrooms as well. Um, and if you need anything else while you're here, um, feel free to come find me. Uh, David over here, who can wave his hand. Here's our pastor, Pastor John. Um, there's many of us who are out and about and here and able to help you and answer questions. Um, again, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the health ministry here at Elmhurst Church. Um, and also announce that we will be having our next um, health lecture April 23rd with Al Backus. I haven't yet heard about the topic, but we are trying to be very active and bring something to you um, at least once a month. Now, since we are a Christian church, I would like to open just with a brief word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that we can all be here together to gather in your name. We ask that you bless all who are here uh, in the church with us and all those who are watching online. And we ask that you bless our speaker, Lisa, as she prepares and gives her lecture to us. Please speak to her and speak through her and let her words and your words through her be a blessing for all who are here. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So our speaker today is Lisa Valiente. She is a licensed clinical social worker with 25 years of experience in social services. She holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from Portland State University in Portland, Oregon, and a master's degree in social work from the University of St. Francis in Joliet, Illinois. She is a member of Phi Alpha National Social Work Honor Society and also a member of the Spanish National Honor Society. For the first three years of her career, Lisa has mentored youth involved in the criminal justice system in a restorative justice program in Portland, Oregon. And the following 15 years, she worked in the child welfare system in a variety of roles, um, case manager, adoption, social worker, and then supervisor. After graduating with her master's in social work, Lisa worked as a behavior therapist to children with autism and their families. And currently, Lisa is working as a therapist for older adults and people with chronic and severe mental illness in several long-term care facilities. She is married to Sergio Valiente and has a 17-year-old son, Nicholas, who makes her laugh and keeps her on her toes with his energy. The Valientes live in Bolingbrook, Illinois, and are members of the Naperville Seventh-day Adventist Church. In her free time, Lisa loves to spend time with her family, reading, spending time outdoors, hiking and cycling, and just taking in the beauty of God's creation. Lisa relies on her faith in God and her own healing experience from depression and anxiety to inform her work with her clients. Helping people has been an inspirational experience that has reaffirmed for her implicit trust that people have the desire and ability to overcome hardships by working together in faith. So with this, um, I will ask Lisa to come up and thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so I have to get this thing up. I don't know if it's up yet. Oh, this looks very different than I recall. Okay. Um, so I, I'm here to talk about uh, depression and anxiety. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. Okay. So as you all are aware, um, I'm here to talk about um, overcoming depression and anxiety. And a little bit about our background. Um, I don't know if the slide is up. Okay, it's up now. Um, when I was asked to um, just kind of give a talk on mental health in general, I kind of was 
trying to figure out what I was going to talk about. Um, and basically, the Lord was really leading me to talk about depression and anxiety. And that was really for a couple of reasons. Um, well, one, depression and anxiety is, you know, just one of the most common mental health conditions that people tend to have. So, but on the other hand, um, I think just during this time of COVID, I think as we're all, you know, so painfully aware is that um, really there's kind of like a secondary epidemic of depression and anxiety um, because there's, for a lot of reasons, there's been a lot of loss. Um, and um, just a variety of things, but to get to the next point about this, um, one thing that I um, started to realize, and then I went to a seminar about this, is just things that cause trauma in general. And COVID actually, uh, just the whole nature of the pandemic itself um, has ingredients um, that are traumatizing in and of itself. So for instance, um, one, um, the COVID pandemic really caused a threat of death or severe harm. People die from it, or less so now, but people were dying from it. Um, then it also contained um, an element of lack of control, um, an aspect of uh, confinement, you know, uh, what, is it, what was it called, sheltering in place? Um, there was that, the element of uncertainty, um, unpredictability, and the unknown. And all of those elements combined can cause um, trauma in, an individu in individuals. So those are certainly about ingredients. So there's a good reason to talk about depression and anxiety. Um, okay. So understanding the terminology, what is depression and one, what is anxiety? So clinical depression um, is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of being down, depressed, hopeless, and a persistent lack of interest or pleasure in doing things, or uncharacteristic irritability. Um, it affects how one feels, thinks, and behaves. So it can lead to a variety of emotional and physical problems. Uh, some people may feel generally miserable or unhappy without really knowing why, and some people may feel um, as if life is not worth living. Um, so more than just the blues, depression is a weakness and isn't just a weakness, sorry, and one can't simply just snap out of it or tough it out. Um, there's also, just to distinguish, there's also uh, bipolar depression, which is a little bit different. Um, it, it, for, it used to be called manic depression back in the 80s. Um, but it causes extreme mood swings, um, so one could have emotional highs, uh, which are called mania and hypomania, um, and lows, which would be the depression. And it's a lifelong disorder that is thought to be more biological um, in origin. Um, so when mood shifts to mania or hypomania, which is basically less extreme than mania, one may feel euphoric, full of energy, or unusually irritable. This is, you know, you'll see a uh, person's, I, didn't, I haven't had to sleep in five days. I've had all this energy and creativity, and, and look what I've written and done, and, done, and uh, don't stop me and, 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 and talking over you. Um, so there's, those are some of those um, characteristics of a manic episode. Um, so this moods, um, actually I just I jumped ahead of myself. They affect sleep, energy, activity, judgment. You see a lot of impulsivity, unfortunately, a lot of overspending, um, risk, risky behavior at times, um, and the ability to think clearly. So episodes of mood swings may occur rarely or multiple times a year. Uh, while most people experience some emotional symptoms between episodes, some may not experience any at all. So moving on to anxiety. So anxiety is not normal anxiety, and I wanted to make sure to say that. So we all have anxiety at different points in our lives, or you, some people will just call it stress. So they're you know, based on the circumstances. I have a big test coming up, um, or I have a big presentation to give, so I, I feel anxious. But guess what? It goes away after the situation has resolved. Okay, so the test is over, I can now relax. Um, so it goes away. Um, clinical anxiety or anxiety disorders feature constant fear, worry, um, and restlessness that um, creates a disturbance 
in perception, emotions, and behavior. Um, one uh, will feel on edge. Um, they may have difficulty sleeping, um, on the verge of panic. Some people really have panic disorder. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, which hampers normal functioning and uh, must be treated. So these feelings of anxiety and panic are difficult to control, um, are out of proportion to the actual danger. I wanna keep that in mind. And can last a long time. One may avoid places or situations to prevent these feelings and symptoms may start during childhood um, or teen years and continue into adulthood, but that doesn't necessarily always, that's not always the case. Um, so there are lots of different types of uh, anxiety disorders. Um, Agoraphobia is a type of anxiety disorder in which um, a person fears or avoids places or situations that might cause panic and often makes a person feel trapped, helpless, or embarrassed. So that's often associated with social anxiety disorder, kind of the fear of having an anxiety or panic attack in a social uh, situation. Um, so these are the people that also don't leave the house. Um, they don't want to go on, uh, you know, in a grocery store where there are a lot of people around. Um, anxiety disorder due to medical conditions includes symptoms of intense anxiety or panic that are directly caused by a physical health problem. Um, you know, a person who has diabetes and, uh, or somebody who has high blood pressure and their blood pressure is really through the roof right now, they're gonna feel a lot of anxious, or they're gonna be really anxious. Um, so a generalized anxiety disorder is kind of the one that is the trickiest because um, that actually is a habit of being anxious, just in general about everything that you could be anxious about. Um, it includes persistent and excessive um, anxiety and worry about activities or events, even ordinary routine issues. Um, the worry is out of proportion to the actual circumstance, and it's difficult to control and affects how you feel physically. It often occurs along with other anxiety disorders and depression. So, yeah, this one is kind of like, well, I, I don't want to make light of it, but I, I you know, I have a certain rapport with a certain client who has, who deals with this. And I said, what is this, your hobby? You know, like, you know, you, you, can, you need to kind of retire from this. Um, but it kind of has that sense sometimes. Um, panic disorder is really the most, um, like, you know, the severest of uh, symptoms. You know, you could have mild, moderate, or severe anxiety. This is like psh, over the top. So this is, a person actually feels like they're dying. Like people often go into hospitals thinking that they're having a heart attack, you know, because their heart is beating and uh, the world is spinning. Um, so this one often, this one involves repeated episodes of sudden feelings of intense anxiety, a fear of terror that reach a peak within minutes. Um, and a panic attack usually, it, it actually is no more than 20 minutes. Um, it does go away. Um, but it's extremely terrifying, for obviously, if you feel like you're dying. Um, so selective mutism, that tends to be more in children, and um, it's when they basically decide not to speak because they're too overwhelmed emotionally, and they're just, they're not, they're not coping. And so they just stop working, they stop working, they stop speaking, which gets in the way of, you know, functioning, um, obviously. Um, so separation anxiety is also tends to be more of a childhood disorder as well. And you see this more in kids when they're beginning school, like preschool and kindergartners who are transitioning from being at home all the time. And so, um, but this would manifest itself in the child um, just kind of breaking down, um, you know, not just crying excessively or being really clingy onto the parent as they're dropping them off at, um, preschool or kindergarten or something like that. And then as I was talking about a little bit earlier, social anxiety disorder, um, sometimes people also call that a social phobia, involves high levels of anxiety, fear, and avoidance of social situations. Um, the person tends to feel embarrassed about themselves, really self-conscious, is everybody looking at me? 
Um, what if they're going to look at my shoes? What if they don't like my hair? I mean, a lot of things like that. Like the, the, the feeling is that everybody is watching them. Um, and they're thinking negative thoughts. And it's horrible. Um, so there are also a bunch of specific phobias. <laughs> and I'm not going to go into, I, actually, I mean, it's like this. Um, uh, fear of spiders, um, you know, um, fear of heights, uh, things like that. Um, so it's when a person is just anxious about that one thing. Although they do tend to have um, overlapping symptoms with other types of anxiety. Then there's substance-induced anxiety disorder, um, and that occurs if there is a misuse of drugs um, or taking medications and, you know, just having um, withdrawal from, from drugs itself. And then there are other specified anxiety disorders and unspecified, I, you know, I, I actually, yeah. Basically, it's anxiety that people don't really know how to specify. So how do I know if I or a loved one has depression or anxiety? And I mean on a clinical sense. So we're just going to go through some symptom review really quick. Um, you can use some self-testing screening tools that are available online. They're open source. And actually, I use them in my practice because they're very easy and, you know, gets down to the stuff. So they're really quick, and it's basically you're self-scoring. You're, you're observing your own behavior. And, of course, seeing a professional if you really want to get an accurate diagnosis and um, treatment. So um, going into the specific symptoms of depression, um, you might actually have depression, uh, an episode of it once in your lifetime. Uh, a single episode, or you can have multiple episodes, or it could be chronic, meaning that the depression doesn't resolve. Um, and uh, so, and that's basically, if you are still depressed after two months, it's considered recurrent. So people typically have multiple episodes, though, and during these episodes, um, they're present for most of the day, and nearly every day, and may include the following. Um, feelings of sadness, tearfulness, emptiness, or hopelessness, angry outbursts, irritability or frustration, even over small matters, loss of interest or pleasure in most or all normal activities, um, such as sex, hobbies, sports, um, sleep disturbances, including insomnia or sleeping too much, um, tiredness, lack of energy, um, even so for small tasks, you know, um, Sometimes the goal is to get up in the morning. Um, reduced appetite and weight loss or increased cravings for food can actually occur too. So there's disturbance in, in eating. Um, you can also have uh, anxiety and agitation. So people would call that like an agitated depression. Um, slowed thinking. Um, you know, uh, speaking or body movements. Um, so it's like gross motor retardation. The person looks like they're in uh, slow motion. Um, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, fixation on past failures or self-blame. Um, trouble thinking, concentrating, making decisions, and remembering things. Um, frequent or recurrent thoughts of death, um, suicidal thoughts, and then, of course, suicidal attempts at times or suicide. And not everybody who has depression um, is thinking about suicide or attempts it, but it definitely, um, it's, it's there. Um, and you could also have some unexplained physical symptoms such as back pain or headaches. Okay. So I, I also wanted to make a note that um, there's some people, um, it's some people use depression um, to describe somebody who's actively grieving and they're actually not the same thing. And I just wanted to make sure to say that. Um, if you really want to differentiate between, you know, uh, somebody with depression or somebody who's actively grieving, uh, the person who's actively grieving um, will have a healthy self-esteem intact. So they won't have uh, thoughts like, I'm a terrible person um, or anything along those lines. Um, but then that assumes that there are no pre-existing um, depression to begin with. For those who have a history of depression, grief can actually be complicated. Symptoms, uh, depression uh, symptoms in children and teens, they're a little bit different. Um, and then also, let me start with younger children. Um, so you might actually see irritability uh, and clinginess, um, you know, more temper tantrums. Um, you might see um, bodily or somatic symptoms, aches and pains, refusing to go to school, being underweight. 
Um, in teens, um, symptoms may include sadness, irritability, uh, feeling negative and worthless, a lot of anger or some, um, poor performance or attendance at school, uh, feeling misunderstood, uh, extremely sensitive, using recreational drugs or alcohol, eating or sleeping too much, self-harm, loss of interest in normal activities, and avoidance of social interaction. So you see some, some more anger involved and some school difficulty. Okay. So depression also presents itself um, differently in older adults. Um, sometimes people <laughs> are characterizing depression as being a normal part of, of aging or growing older, but that's actually not true. Um, and so, some, so basically, as a result, people tend to minimize uh, depression in older adults, or the older adults themselves do. Unfortunately, um, so it goes undiagnosed or untreated, and um, so people are just reluctant to seek help. So the differences are there could be um, memory difficulties and personality changes. There could be memory difficulties anyway with the aging process. Um, but if you're noticing that, um, that could be a clue. Uh, physical aches or pain, again, I mean, that could be associated with aging too, but if it just seems a little bit off. Um, fatigue, loss of appetite, uh, sleep problems or loss of interest in sex not caused by medical condition or medication. And there's, this is the biggest one that I've noticed is more self-isolation, wanting to stay at home um, rather than going out and socializing or doing new things. Um, suicidal thinking or feelings, especially in older men, as a matter of fact. And that actually is the highest um, risk group for suicide is um, men 60 or over. Um, then you see um, differences in gender. So men do actually manifest depression differently than women. So you could see more escapist behavior, such as spending a lot of time at work or sports. So you've got your uh, workaholism in there, right? 12-hour workdays, um, physical symptoms such as headaches, digestive problems, and pain, um, problems with alcohol and drug use um, could be in there. It's not with everybody, but it's there. Um, controlling violent or abusive behavior. So if you're seeing that a lot in, in a man, you really do need to consider, is this person depressed? Um, irritability and inappropriate anger. Um, risky behavior, such as reckless driving. Okay. So now we move on <laughs> to the medical causes of anxiety. For some people, anxiety may be linked to an underlying health issue. Um, in some cases, anxiety signs and symptoms are the first indicators of a medical illness. So examples of medical problems that can be linked to anxiety are actually, this is a lot more than I really thought when I was researching this. Um, heart disease, diabetes, thyroid problems, such as hyperthyroidism, uh, respiratory disorders, such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD and asthma, drug misuse or withdrawal, withdrawal from alcohol, anti-anxiety medications, and other medications. Other medical causes, chronic pain or irritable bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease, rare tumors that produce certain fight or flight hormones. Um, sometimes anxiety can be a side effect of certain medications. Um, it's possible that your anxiety may be due to an underlying medical condition if you don't um, have any blood relatives. So that could be something that you could, you know, that might stand out for you. Um, you didn't have any anxiety as a child um, or a disorder. Um, you don't avoid certain things or situations because of anxiety. So there are really no other symptoms um, of anxiety other than this medical condition that you have. Um, you have a, a sudden occurrence of anxiety that seems unrelated to life events, um, and you didn't have a previous history of anxiety. It's just right there. Okay, <clears throat> so note on medical issues. Medical concerns can cause a person to become depressed or anxious as an emotional reaction. These are um, medical causes themselves or physical causes that can create, um, can create um, symptoms of. And I don't know if that makes sense as a distinction, but I wanted to make that note. So um, there are risk factors that make a person more susceptible to becoming depressed or anxious. Um, and the number one um, is trauma. So children who endure um, abuse or trauma or witness traumatic events are at a higher risk of developing um, an anxiety disorder, and I could put depression in there too. Um, adults who experience a traumatic event also can develop anxiety or depression, actually. Um, stress due to an illness. 
and actually that's what I was just talking about. Having a health condition basically is very, um, can be very stressful for people and uh, the, the worry can really get out of hand. Um, and just stress build up in your life. Um, it could be a number of things. You know, you had a cascade of events, uh, a couple deaths in the family, uh, work stress, ongoing worry about finances. And we go back to uh, COVID again. People had uh, lost their jobs and all sorts of things. They had financial problems, maybe. Um, work problems, um, lots of deaths. So yeah, it's, it's right there. Okay, so when I was talking about the screening tools, these are the ones that I was referring to. These are really quick and easy to use. Um, that's why I put them there. Um, it's not like a long questionnaire. Um, most of them are like seven to nine questions. Some of them are much more. Um, but it's a self-scoring, so meaning that you basically answer the questions about whether or not you perceive <clears throat> yourself as having the symptoms that are being screened. Yes, and we have handouts um, that will be made available to you um, at the end of the, um, the presentation. So how to overcome, that's why everyone is here, right? Um, so the easiest way is to understand the thought, feeling, and behavior connection. So there's a general principle. Our thoughts, emotions, and behavior are all interrelated and act upon one another. So um, how and what we think directly affects how we feel and how we feel directly affects how we behave. Okay, so for example, having negative and fatalistic thoughts will very likely make us feel down, sad, or hopeless. We might also struggle with low energy and completing every, you know, everyday needed tasks. Having fearful or worrisome thoughts causes us to feel anxious, right? So we might then struggle um, with being able to slow down and relax, think rationally. So the, actually the most effective form of uh, treatment, and this is after lots of, lots of research over decades, um, is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes it's called to, uh, is referred to as CBT, combined with medication when needed. That is, that is the best one. So this is just an illustration of the thought behavior, um, thought feeling and behavior um, connection that I was talking about. So um, what we think about affects how we feel, what we feel affects our behaviors, and how we behave then f uh, affects how we think. You said uh, with the medication aspect of it, what yeah. is your That would be discussed like on an individual basis with your psychiatrist because then, um, they, they'll be able to talk to you about what uh, treatment resistant issues you have. And um, I could talk to you a little bit after in more depth if you'd like. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's a good question, though. <clears throat> okay. So. Basically, the healing is then to restore the thought, feeling, and behavior connection to what it's really supposed to be. So to heal and overcome is to restore the proper balance of our thoughts, feelings, and behavior in alignment with God's original design. So the cognitive behavior therapy um, model mentioned earlier runs parallel to this concept of realigning and restoring the proper relationship between our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Well, so it seems really simple, right? Well, yeah, but it's not easy for a couple of reasons, and here's, here, here they are. So we're likely to be unaware of our faulty or distorted thinking to begin with. Um, we cannot become aware of our distorted thinking on our own. We need a helper. And we have, um, what happens a lot is people have a distorted view of God um, and believe he is angry and is punishing us. Um, He's not the compassionate God of agape love that the Bible tells us he is. I see that a lot. So examples of negative thoughts. I'm not going to actually read these out loud. Um, and the reason is that I don't want to give anybody any um, possible trigger to a negative thought that could cause depression. So I'm going to just take a minute to pause, just scan over them. And you might see that you may have had, I think we all have had some of these thoughts at some of the time in our lives. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're depressed, but these are things that um, are associated with depressive thinking. 
And you know the funny thing is, um, when you're, in, when you're ther in a therapy session and somebody is talking to you and one of these thoughts comes out, it's really funny because, did I say that out loud? And then they say, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, you know, because a lot of, because it's distorted. And so it, it helps to really review and become conscious of this stuff. So I'm not gonna keep going, I'm not gonna say them out loud. Here's some more stuff. And I'm putting a lot of them out here because there's so many, um, so many ways that our thoughts can really become rather distorted. And is everyone able to see those okay enough to read? Okay. And there's more. Yes, indeed. And this, uh, this is the last page, I, I promise. <laughs> All right, so those were the ones for depression. Now we're gonna go on to anxiety. Um, so catastrophizing, that's one of the ones that I see a lot. That basically means that a person is envisioning any possible catastrophic event that could, but has not happened. So, um, oh, I could get into a car accident. Well, we can all get into a car accident, but you know, it, it's so, it gets to a, a situation where the, you cannot resolve through reason. So basically, you look at the worst case scenario, that usually it's like, well, what if this, and what if that? Um, so that's an example of uh, catastrophizing. Um, emotional reasoning. reasoning. Um, so basing your perceptions on how you feel. So, okay. Um, thinking that you, because you feel anxious, there must be something dangerous happening. Actually, that happens a lot with um, people who have generalized anxiety disorder. They just feel anxious, so it's kind of like in their mind, they're making a mental scan of, you know, their surroundings or the circumstances of their lives. So, um, mind reading, uh, believing that you know what other people are thinking about you, and most generally, it's negative. Oh, they don't like me, they think I'm stupid, etc. Jumping to conclusions, believing that you know the outcome of an event with no logical or factual evidence to support that belief. I won't apply because I won't get the job. Um, shoulds and musts, placing high expectation on ourselves and then constantly worrying about not fulfilling our expectations. I should have done this and I should have done that. It's the shoulda, coulda, woulda stuff. Um, black and white thinking, um, seeing everything in absolutes without you know, considering that there might be something in, in between. Um, personalization, making yourself the reason for bad things um, that happen. If someone looks upset, it's because of you. You did something to offend them. And, and these things, it's important to point out that these things happen without the person being consciously aware that they're doing it. They don't even know they're doing it until of course you sit down and start talking about it. Um, focusing on the negative. Um, so actually so people call it, I think what did we call this? Negative filtering, yes. So you could have a whole bunch of stuff happen that's, that's awesome and amazing, and then you'll pick the one thing out of it that didn't work out very well, and you'll focus on that. So that's, a lot of people do that. I've done it, so. Discounting the positives. Oh, actually, I think that's about what I just said. <laughs> okay, I think I went too far. Relationships. Okay, so when we were talking about that, um, the thought, feeling, and behavior um, relationship, or the cognitive triangle, as some people call them. Well, this extends out to relationships, right? Because how we behave, doesn't that affect people that we're close to? So you might have recognized your own thinking at one point or another in some of the examples of distorted uh, thought patterns. And you might have also recognized the voice of a loved one saying these things to you. Um, oh, you're never gonna amount to anything. You never do anything right. And unfortunately, people tend to voice the insecurities that they have in their head and project them on other people. Um, so, 
um, basically, yeah, we'll act out our behavior towards those around us, usually to those um, we're closest to and are around uh, the most often. So the amygdala, why did I bring this up? So if you are somebody who did experience trauma, um, the amygdala is basically the alert system of the brain. And um, so it picks up and basically anything that we can get through our five senses and it'll attach it. If it, there's something that happened, maybe somebody was wearing a, you know, a certain perfume when the traumatic event occurred, they smell that perfume again and they're back to the, the traumatic event. So it'll trigger the amygdala to basically fire and start out the alarm system or the fight or flight um, kind of responses. And so that literally is the hijacking of the thinking part of the brain. Um, it literally happens. I talk to a neurologist, they can give you more um, uh, specifics, but you're not thinking. Um, so if a tiger came at me right now, I wouldn't be analyzing what I should do. My amygdala would take over and I would either hit it with something, I probably wouldn't, I'd probably run, you know what I mean? So, or if you're about to get into a car accident, you might notice all the adrenaline going through, right, you know, so anyway, we all know what fight or flight is. So it takes over our thinking. Our, our rational brain is actually offline completely. So I bring this up to say that those who have trauma, then this is another complication to thinking rationally. There's also the influence of inherited sin, cultivated sin, and learning be learned behavior. So we all know, I'll just review it though. Inherited sin, all of humanity has naturally inherited the sinfulness or inherited sinfulness, and we require a savior to transform us back to a God's original design for us in the Garden of Eden. So there is equality in sin for all mankind, and all have fallen below the glory of God, as we know. It is normal to suffer in a sinful world. All of creation is groaning due to sin. So cultivated sin, some of us have not chosen God's way and not allowed him to transform us, right? So we have not surrendered our sinfulness and allowed our sinful nature to grow into habits that shape our character, but still, God works with us to transform us back to his original design for us too. Okay, so then this kind of gets to um, what a lot of people call the generational curses. I don't know if anyone has heard about that, but it basically involves a mix of both inherited and cultivated sin. So we all innocently inherited sinful natures, right? But then we all get to choose whether to cultivate sin in our lives or not um, as we become aware of what uh, right and wrong is. So people grew up, for instance, so people who grew up in a chaotic or abusive family um, innocently inherited learned behaviors that were sinful, right? So when you're mad, yeah, um, what do you do? Well, you get into a fist fight, you know, um, but we know that that's not the best way to do it, but if that's a learned behavior that some people have. Um, so, but there's also some faulty thinking involved in that too. So if you had um, part of the abuse is your, your parents were verbally abusive, yeah. Okay, so really I am terrible. I can't do anything right, because why? Because my parents told me. If my parents told me, it must be true, right? So there's this inherited learned faulty uh, thinking and feeling and behaving that um, comes about and it becomes a generational curse actually. So one in that situation will need to make a conscious and sustained effort over time to undo the damage to prevent them from, guess what, passing it on again because that's what's going to happen. Um, so this is actually um, very hard to experience and to accept for obvious reasons, because here you are with a lot of work to do. So many people who suffer from anxiety and depression experience a general curse of some kind, a generational curse of, sorry, excuse me, of some kind. Um, it could be what I was talking about before, alcoholism, uh, domestic violence, child abuse, neglect, narcissistic family members. Those are just some examples. So again, whatever we think, feel, or act out has an eternal impact on not just ourselves, but other people. What we say or do in anger, what we say or don't do in the depths of depression can have lasting consequences um, that can actually take years to undo. Um, misunderstanding God's character. 
crying out to God in prayer, laying our concerns on the altar can be hard actually for anxious and depressed people. Um, anyone operating on a misunderstanding of God's character um, will have difficulty doing this because there's often great mistrust or distrust in who God is. So if you believed that God is angry at you and wants to punish you, why would you go to that God in prayer, right? It doesn't make sense. So why put your concerns on the altar to a God you perceive to be unloving, angry, or punishing? He would definitely not answer you according to your need, would he? But we know that God is loving and does want us to heal. We know that for sure. So let's look back. I think this is a good illustration at the original sin um, at the fall as an example. So when Adam and Eve ate of that forbidden fruit of the tree of good and evil, what were Adam and Eve's first emotional responses to the sin? Shame, guilt, fear, right? So then they took their own steps that they devised to correct or hide the sin. So they made what is out of the fig leaves, right? Um, to hide their sin, their guilt and their fear. They tried to cover their shame and push down their feelings uh, because they were too painful. And that is actually what a lot of people do. In fact, most people do. There is this desire to push down any feeling that is really just too painful. Um, so they believed Satan's lie and covered up their feelings with lies too. But how did God respond to them? I think this is fascinating. So he responded with gentle prodding. What have you done? Trying to get them gently to see um, what they did, to woo them to repent, not force. Um, and then woo them to receive the Lord's restoration, right? So the true healing then is for us to allow God to restore us and to realize and actually to restore our, um, our understanding of who God is, who his character is, that he actually loves us, he doesn't want to punish us, and he wants us to get better. He wants us to be restored to his original design of us uh, before sin. Um, and then um, true healing is to allow God to transform us, to think, believe, and act on the truth, his truth, and process thought and emotions the way God would have us do. So to be more like Christ with changed hearts, to be complete in Christ. We often suffer in hiding uh, too with the same feelings that Adam and Eve had after the fall, shame, guilt, fear, and why do people not seek help for um, their mental health problems? Right here, right? Shame, guilt, fear, absolutely. I don't want somebody to judge me. I'm ashamed of myself, right? Maybe the therapist will be like that mean God. And a sense of helplessness and hopelessness, right? Um, trying to push down those painful feelings. Um, the role of compassion. So compassion is actually very important for the healing process. Um, compassion for others starts with being compassionate towards ourselves. Our forgiveness for ourselves and others is so essential to allowing God to work in us because it necessitates that we acknowledge our inherited and cultivated sins and ask for the strength to overcome them. In short, um, when we are honest about our sinfulness, the natural response to is humility and compassion for the next poor soul who is struggling to. So chances are, if, if you're suffering, somebody else is suffering too. That's just, you know, logical. But of course, that's not how we're thinking um, when we're down or anxious. This way we can be supportive and cooperative, and basically, I'm sorry, supportive and cooperate in one another's journey to healing. So, True healing is actually part of God's plan of salvation, too. This is a nice quote from um, a psychiatrist who is an Adventist, um, Dr. Timothy Jennings. This is the process that the Bible describes as growing up in Christ, as becoming a mature Christian. Mature Christians are those who have developed the ability to discern truth from error, to think for themselves, to tolerate negative feelings, to maintain self-control and to value truth over the opinion of others. 
This restored unity with God is the entire focus of the Bible. It is God's plan for salvation. And this is another quote from him. Consider that salvation derives from the root salve, which means to heal. God's plan of salvation involves taking us as sick, weak-minded, selfish beings and healing the damage to our minds, restoring the ability to think clearly, love freely, act justly, and stand solidly for what is right, and thereby transforming us from God's enemies into his friends. So God is love, and all of God's decisions are predicated on agape love and a divine rescue operation to save our souls. God uses people and the principles of health to bring us to be healed through the transforming of our minds. Jesus brings us to healing by means of his choosing, through his helpers, through professionals, through the word. It is okay to ask for help, even professional help, if you or someone you love suffers and you do not know how to help them. So how to find good help? Well, the first one is to pray for the Lord to place someone in your life that he wants to work with you. The second one, you know, just to consult your provider directory that you have through insurance plans, see who's in your network, excuse me, and then you could look up the individuals online, look at their background, Um, and um, I should note that some therapists, if you don't have, um, if if you're not happy, if your network isn't very good and you're not finding someone on your network, there are therapists who uh, do uh, provide some sliding scale based on income. Um, ask somebody you trust. So uh, see if a friend, colleague, or doctor you know trusts, or basically knows somebody that they trust. Okay. There's also some databases. Um, there's one um, within the Adventist Church. It's called a, multiple, a Multitude of Counselors. And they have some talks, or have had some talks on 3ABN. Um, there, what was the name of that guy? Um, he, he's come to do um, talks here. Uh, I can't remember his name now, but he's, he's part of this group anyway. Um, and then the American Psychological Association, American Association of uh, Marriage and Family Therapists, they all have databases um, of different uh, clinicians. Yeah, that's not, he's not part of this group, but that's one of them, yeah. Um, explore um, local uh, resources. So you might consider reaching out to church for a list of licensed therapists affiliated with your faith. Um, Your community may also have resources to help you. Um, So, you know, maybe if you're a student, your school might have, um, you know, a counseling center or something like that. If you're employed, your, uh, what is that, EAP, the Employee Assistant Program, you can actually get free therapy through your job that way. Um, Your HR department, department might have a list of therapists as well. Um, and then there are also um, specialty interests um, with their specific problems that you're dealing with, such as domestic or sexual abuse. Um, you might be able to find group or individual therapy through a local advocacy organization. Um, and then there's also, you know, a, again, certain focus for different um, issues. Um, there's National Eating Disorders Association. Anxiety and Depression Association of America, National Center for um, Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder, or PTSD. Um, Okay. All right. I I think what would be helpful, too, is if if you are um, aware of what your goals are in therapy ahead of time, really, what do you want to work on? What do you want to see change so that you can uh, discuss that with um, your therapist or potential therapist to make sure you're on the same page and are working towards the same goal? Um, And also, um, it's important to note, too, that your your goals might actually change while you're in therapy. You might resolve something, and then you'll find uh, there's something deeper there, and you talk about that. And that's okay. You just talk about it. Um, Also, if you think medication may help with some symptoms, You'll want to find a psychiatrist or a psychiatric nurse practitioner um, who could prescribe some medications. Um, Well, yeah, I was going to say they don't don't do therapy. They don't usually do therapy, but some do, some nurse practitioners and some psychiatrists, but they're very rare. Um, 
And then if you want to be part of a supportive network of people, you might actually consider uh, group therapy. A lot of people find a lot of help with that. It makes them feel like I'm not the only one. Um, also, um, this has become more and more popular because of COVID and trying to you know, stay socially distanced is you know, online therapy. That's actually a huge thing. Um, so there's BetterHelp, Amwell, those are just two, but there's a lot of them. And, and actually a lot of practices that were just you know, in office before are offering um, telehealth is what it's called now. Um, and actually, um, some people have described it because they find it more convenient Somehow people are liking it a little bit better. Um, and then make sure to ask questions about the things that matter to you and uh, take notes when you're talking to the potential therapist so you remember what they said. Um, these are just my references. And I am done. That concludes my uh, lecture. So you said you wanted to do some uh, questions and answers. OK. Yeah. So that people who are, okay, it is on. Okay, so you just mentioned having a goal for your yeah. therapy. Right. Okay, so, you, so apparently you mean something more than just not feeling depressed anymore. Could you give an example of what a goal might be? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, oh. <laughs> um, I think that, you know, it is okay to just go with that. So I wouldn't put pressure on yourself. Um, you don't have to like do your homework and, and write down, this is my goal or anything like that. Look, if you go in and say, I don't feel good, that's good enough because the therapist will draw out exactly what that is. So I wouldn't worry about that. We have another question this way. You mentioned that bipolar disorder is uh, biological. Could you expand on that? Well, um, it tends to be inherited. So if you have first degree, like your parents um, who have bipolar disorder, there's, you're much more likely to have it yourself. Um, and when I say biological too, um, you know, it's one, of the, um, it's one of those mental health disorders that really is not enough just to do like talk therapy because, um, you know, if somebody's having a manic episode, right, they're, they're up for days and they're talking nonstop. Like, I can't just sit there and, I'm not that I would say this as a therapist, calm down. But I mean, you can't, you can't talk really, uh, talk reason through them. It is, why am I having such a hard time describing this? But it is, it's biological. It is something to do with their, um, the chemistry in the body and, uh, and the brain. Thank you for mentioning chemistry. Can I take a, make a note yeah. really quickly? Yeah. Um, I actually recently, probably last year, read a book by William Walsh, who was a researcher. He um, has or had an institute here in Naperville, mm -hmm. the William Walsh Research Institute, something like that. And he wrote a book called Nutrient Power. Um, there's something like 20,000 or 40,000 patients that he um, studied clinically to see nutritional imbalances, nutritional deficiencies, and how they affected mm -hmm. things like bipolar, depression, anxiety, all kinds of things. And what's very interesting is these people fell into particular categories of nutrients that were missing. So it's quite fascinating. Um, he talked a lot about um, essential fatty acids, B vitamins especially, and then depending on sort of the category, there were other things, taurine, choline, and whatnot. But um, yeah, if you're interested in, in something like bipolar, William Walsh, and, and I believe the book is called Nutrient Power. Mm. Um, very, very good book. Mm. Okay, good to know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah. So, okay, hereditary. I'm going to answer something <laughs> hereditary. There's a whole field of medicine right now called epigenetics. I don't know, has anybody heard the term epigenetics? We've yeah. all heard of genetics, 
but epigenetics is how your genes are expressed. Just because somebody in your family had something doesn't mean that you have to express those same genes. We have um, genes that are turned off, genes that are turned on, and it's all due to chemicals in the body that turn these genes on and off. Mm -hmm. So of course, if you eat the same foods, if you're doing the same thing, living the same lifestyle as your parents, grandparents, chances are you might develop whatever they had as well. Yeah. But we also have the power to change what we're doing, Absolutely. change our experiences, yeah. and therefore change our epigenetic settings that don't express right. those same genes. Yeah. So it's very, very fascinating. This is also a, a newer um, field yeah, of medicine. Yeah, that's absolutely true, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Um, I also want to mention, um, after we're done with question and answers, we also will have refreshments, so um, feel free to stay and join and, you know, uh, talk to one another and, and ask more questions. Sure. Um, any other questions in the audience or online? How do we know if someone's asking a question online? They'll tell us. Oh, okay. okay. Secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Going once, going twice. Yes. After Sergio. Um. Can you emphasize what not to tell someone with depression? Because some people like, you know, make mistakes when trying to counsel someone that has clinical depression. Okay. Um, just get over it. You're lazy, right? Uh, it's all in your head, yeah. Or this is one that everybody that almost every person that I've ever talked to, they're afraid of being labeled crazy or you know losing face and uh, respect and you know all sorts of things. So, you know, I think in general it's very important to um, to show and demonstrate um, unconditional um, positive regard and respect for that person because they're coming to you when they're falling apart, so yeah, you have to be very respectful, and you just don't brush things off, like, you know, um, and you don't try to tell people, no, you don't feel that way. Um, it's important to validate um, how a person is feeling, not thinking, because as we were talking about before, um, I'm not gonna validate somebody's distorted thinking. That's something that gets corrected, but I will validate the fact that this is very hard for you, and it's very sad. You're sad right now. That to, so basically to have a safe and validating kind of environment is important. There is a question, online question. Can babies get the mom's depression? Um, so there's been instances of infants and children in early childhood getting depressed. Um, it's usually about attachment issues. So um, a child who has been separated uh, for whatever reason after birth um, from the mother and hasn't had a chance to bond might have some difficulty. Um, there's also been a lot of studies about um, some of the orphanages um, in Eastern Europe and Russia where the uh, babies were not touched at all and they basically just turned over eventually, were unresponsive to any human contact or touch and just died. That's really a bummer to talk about, but um, <laughs> yeah, it is possible. Um, it's, imp it's really important that, you know, obviously children get the uh, loving affection um, from their parents, for sure. Uh, but yeah, it's usually due to um, attachment issues. Um, that that would happen. But in terms of, um, well, heredity is heredity. So yeah, it probably, if say like somebody um, inherited bipolar disorder, you know, through their mother, um, you know, those symptoms might not manifest for quite some time though, if that makes any sense. Okay. okay but the next question is still based on the uh, bipolar disorder. The, you mentioned episodes or um, periods of time where certain behavior changes dramatically. It'll be very energetic or down. 
Is there a specific trigger for that, or is just the, in itself the chemical imbalance? There are triggers to that, actually. Um, it is a chemical um, imbalance, but it's also it can also be triggered. Um, so a person who uh, just went through a traumatic experience might have, it might trigger, um, it could either trigger a manic, well, actually it's probably gonna trigger a manic episode, um, or a person who's under extreme stress. In fact, it kind of depends on the person and their personal history, and part of a, a therapy that, you know, process is identifying what those triggers are. So what happened right before you had that manic episode? Let's talk about that. So, yeah. It's both, actually. I'll make one more note on the um, chemical imbalance in bipolar. My husband just reminded me. So uh, this is also something that William Walsh talks about in the book, Nutrient Power. But there's a genetic test for methyl tetrahydrofolate. So um, it's, it's a form of folate that is most needed in this cycle that produces neurotransmitters in the body. And it's estimated that something like 30% of the population has some kind of a mutation. There's two different, um, two different sort of pools of genes, and uh, about 30% of the population has some kind of a mutation. The mutation, depending on which, which particular gene is being affected, um, can reduce this sort of um, folate cycle by 30% or by 60% even, or if you have a double mutation, then you're not properly um, using this folate in the body for uh, the methylation cycle and then further on neurotransmitter production. So this is actually a test that you can do just once in your life to see if you do have this mutation. And the result would be if there is some kind of mutation, then you know that your body isn't properly utilizing folates from, from your food, in which case you would take a methylated folate supplement um, for this condition. So um, it's, it's a genetic test, blood test, yeah. Not, not very expensive, I think about $100 or so from what I understand, yeah. All right, thank you. You're saying probably take, no. Um, if, if you, so there's something called under-methylation and over-methylation. Under-methylation can be a problem, over-methylation can be a problem. So if you're taking the supplement methylfolate and you don't need it, you're actually pushing in the other direction that your body doesn't want to go in. See, we're, we're all, um, with our bodies, always looking for a balance. And you can push the body out of balance in one direction, out of balance in the other direction. So it's, it's possible to take it and not need it and go. Um, and that actually can lead to um, a lot of different uh, psychological disorders, the over-methylated status, which is actually worse. Those end up being um, obsessive, compulsive, uh, kind of like serial killer types almost when they're when they're in this over methylation status. Interesting. So yeah. Oh, go ahead. So I have a couple of friend psychiatrists who said this revolution in psychiatry. Uh, the the testing of empty empty HFR. I would suggest that everybody this look you do it once in a life. It's actually a little bit different 30% is severe methylation enough, and it can affect a lot of almost everything that Lisa mentioned today can be connected to MTH. Hmm. So it's a very simple test, very expensive, and yes, you cannot just guess. You have to know exactly where you are to take proper approach. This, this doesn't mean, since this is a I have to be you know, thorough, that you do not do take drugs or that allow psychiatrists to stop taking drugs, so I'm not going into drug world. But speaking uh, strictly from a nutritional perspective, well-being uh, mental, but also cardiovascular, because these genes have a profound effect on all cardiovascular diseases. I actually had a girl who was young, people 30 and 32, that felt they were he healthy, but when I look at their genes, they had a very strong mutation, and both had cardiovascular conditions developing. 
So it's not only mental. The empty HFR test, I would highly encourage you to go to a doctor and, and test it. Um, I have a question. Sure. Um, title of presentation was change the way we think. How do we do this? Oh, okay. I'm not sure that I got the answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the idea is um, uh, to restore. Uh, how, um, I, 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 my question is basically also how do we help mm -hmm. really, really somebody who is going, who get into this way of thinking? And, and well, I don't think that, um, you know, if somebody is really clinically depressed, I mean, you know, I, I think we all have moments of depression or anxiety, right? But if somebody is really clinically depressed or clinically um, anxious, I wouldn't expect that we as individuals would really be able to treat them necessarily. Um, you know, I, I think because really the, the therapy is like, you know, like you said, just changing the way you think. So it, basically you would need some assistance from usually a, a prof basically a professional to help you really get at what those distorted thoughts are. Because as I was explaining, um, a lot of us aren't even aware that we're having those thoughts when that happens. Um, one thing, the re one of the reasons that I, you know, was showing some of uh, examples of what the negative thoughts would be, is to kind of, um, I guess, so we could look at our own thoughts basically and say, well, I don't know, have I ever thought that before? Because you know, if you start looking through them and you're identifying a good amount of thoughts that are like that that you're having, then that it's kind of a good indication that you know you might really be struggling in that area. So um, yeah, I mean, it's really you need to um, you need to be able to identify the distorted thinking, and um, that isn't usually very easily done on your own, but. Um, I wanted to give that framework to people so that um, people kind of understood what um, the therapy process would be um, for somebody with anxiety and depression. That is to change the way you think because that affects how we feel. So if I'm walking around and I'm thinking that nobody likes me and I'm not going and socializing, um, you know, I might have a hard time getting up in the morning and, and functioning. Um, does, is that answering your question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, why are we coming to this? I mean, it's, I would say it's like epidemic lately. Right. And many people are saying because of the pandemic uh, that was there, but I think there is more to that even before pandemic, we were going in the same direction. And I'm asking yeah. because as a pastor, as a, yeah. as a father, and, and how we can... I know you're yeah. referring to professional. How we can help also as a community? I think that um, you know, for people who are like not professionals, you know, um, I don't know if you were hearing what I was saying before, but it's important not to you know make kind of scolding or sort of negative uh, statements to people, obviously. And I'm not saying that that's what you would be inclined to do anyway. But sometimes family members, in their moments of impatience, you know with someone who's close to them all the time, they might um, let some of that slip out of their, uh, out of their mouths. Um, but I think the importance is to be a supportive, just say, I'm just here to listen. Yeah, I, I think, um, and I didn't actually mention that in here, but people do tend to take more risks, risks in a good way in therapy, taking emotional risks, if they know that they have support for them being in therapy. So. Um, or people that are supportive in their life. You know, you can just give me a call. You know, I'm there just to listen. You know, I think um, that is important. And then making sure when you're talking to them that you're just, I'm really sorry that you're going through this right now. You know, so just being empathetic towards that person and showing an openness. And so you're not shutting that person down. Um, so for, a, for somebody who isn't a professional, I would say, just be there for them. Express that you care. Express, you know, sympathy and empathy. Yes. Um, a few years ago, I had gone through a, a very difficult situation, um, and I was overwhelmed. I was down. I was. I had a very difficult day meeting each moment of each day. Gotcha. 
And it got to the point where I wanted to feel God's arms around me, but I, I didn't even know how to ask. Right. I didn't even know the words to say to bring that about. Yeah. And my mom gave me a little book called Jesus Calling. Mm -hmm. And the, they're very short daily devotionals. Devotionals. Yeah. But they are written as if Jesus is speaking directly to us. Absolutely. And I have never read anything like that in my life. That's, yeah. I have that one, and I've, yeah. And the way it is written, I'll just take a, a moment sure. and read a little bit of it. I am able to do far beyond all that you ask or imagine. Come to me with positive expectations, knowing that there is no limit to what I can accomplish. Ask my spirit to control your mind so that you can think great thoughts of me. Mm -hmm. Do not be discouraged by the fact that many of your prayers are not yet answered. Time is a trainer teaching you to wait upon me, to trust me in the dark. The more extreme your circumstances, the more likely you are to see my power and glory. Mm -hmm at work in the situation. Instead of let it, letting difficulties draw you into worrying, try to view them as setting the scene for my glorious intervention. Mm. Keep your eyes and your mind wide open to all that I am doing in your life. That's, that's and awesome. And I just prayed those, I read mm -hmm. those. Yeah. And that was better than any prescription Amen. that I could have picked up at Walgreens. Amen. I'm glad that you got that blessing from that. Yeah, I have that devotional, and I, I used that for a long time. Yeah, it's, it's a very good one. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, are there any more questions? There's somebody back over there. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I just kind of wanted to hear your, your opinion and your thoughts um, when it comes to this clinical imbalance that you mentioned, I think that there's a strong stigma around medications, and so I'm kind of wondering if you could give me a little bit of insight on what your opinion is on that, um, because like you mentioned, chemical imbalance is very real, and I think that the stigma behind some people quite literally needing medications can often be forgotten. Well, I am actually somebody who does support medication use because um, there you know, if, for instance, somebody who is severely clinically depressed, this is somebody who's having a hard time getting up, you know, this is somebody who really, I mean, you ask them to go over and charge their phone across the room, and they're, you know, that's, that might be their goal for the day, and I know that sounds really awful, but, I mean, it's, it can get very extreme. So sometimes a person I do think um, needs um, medication, like a, you know, an SSRI for depression, let's say, um, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Those are the most effective for um, uh, depression, not bipolar depression. Um, for uh, bipolar, it's, yeah, usually a mood stabilizer of some kind. No, I, I support it because I support people being healthy. Um, so sometimes people just need that extra kick, so to speak. Um, I don't want to say a kick in the, in the rear end, but essentially that's, it's, you know, having an antidepressant like that actually makes a huge difference for people. I've seen that time and again. So, so I don't have any problem with it. I say go, do what you need to do. We've got one. So what I was understanding from earlier, you're saying that this thing is pretty, it can be pretty much multifactorial. Yeah. And is it, is, it, is it common for sometimes for us to put our eggs in one basket or when we try to figure out? Well, what do you, what well, do you mean by well, that? Well, in other words, there's so many different factors, so many things that can play into whatever the situation may be in our lives. Right. If we're showing some symptoms, right. and is it common sometimes when people look at only one factor? And 
I would actually have to need, I'd require an example for that one. Okay. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. I mean, okay. when okay. I sit for, down for and- For example, yeah. um, it's because I had this happen in my family, I have this. Oh, I see. Or, you know, or I had this happen in my life, or I, this, I see. And, and, and I'm yeah. just wondering if that, if that is, I, I work in a facility that sells health supplements, and I mm -hmm. hear people coming in, they're, making, they're asking questions, and yeah. I have to remind them, hey, I'm not a doctor, okay? <laughs> yeah, know? I hear you, and, yeah. But, but uh, and I hear a lot of people look at one thing mm -hmm. as a cause and not realize that, based on what you've said, there yeah. could be many factors playing together, and that, that would right. be one reason why they should see somebody yeah, so to a lot of for that. Right, and so a lot of the, um, sometimes, you know, um, a person could maybe overlook um, some of the biological uh, impacts um, and solely focus on family dynamics and lose, you know, uh, but, you know, it's important, you know, when you're in the diagnostic interview then to ask a lot of questions. Well, when did these symptoms occur? Did you ever have this before? Did you have problems in school? And, you know, getting like a whole history because, um, Diagnosing in, involves, you know, um, the time frame because there are certain types of um, diagnoses that, you know, for instance, that you really can't have until you're 18. Um, those would be more, those are different. Those are like personality disorders and things like that. Um, but you have to look at the whole thing. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. I agree with that. I don't know if that answered your question, though. Okay. I don't think that you mentioned anything about social media, but is there any correlation between um, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, let's say TikTok, and uh, yeah. depression, anxiety, and fear among our young people, teenagers I and children? Yeah, I, I think so. There's, that's what people talk about this fear of losing out, right? Um, oh, look at my, you know, we actually, that kind of coincides with our um, Sabbath school lesson on uh, coveting. Wow, look at that big house, you know, look at that big car. You know what I'm saying? You, you see pictures of people doing, oh, look at their European vacation, and oh, they have it better than me. Oh, look, you know, um, I do think that's a big part of it. Um, more, more, I would say more for the young. I didn't mention that probably because I'm working with older people that don't get on Facebook. Um, and so that's a blessing for them, frankly. But yeah, I do think so, because it's another avenue that we can compare ourselves with other people, and usually in negative ways, actually. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank this you. was awesome for continuing dialogue, I think, for everybody. Yeah, definitely. So I'm sure we all have either been there or know people who have in many different avenues. Um, so uh, we are going to um, have some refreshments out in the fellowship hall for all of us who are here right now. And I did wanna just mention again, our next health event will be April 23rd um, by retired health and wellness professor Al Backus. He will be talking about the 10 laws of health he will cover how the body responds to too much or not enough stress, exercise, rest, nutrients, and other factors. Um, more information on his lecture and other future events, um, you will be able to find them on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or meetup group. So thank you so much um, for all who attended in person and watched online, and please join us in the fellowship hall. And thank you, Lisa.